Good afternoon, and may I say how uh, happy I am, proud I am to be here, and how wonderful it is to be in Croke Park for me. Um, and I'll, I'll race on because we haven't got a lot of time, and I always pack far too much into these talks, but I, there's a lot I want to say to you, having looked at the Irish situation. First of all, I want a disclaimer that uh, I belong to a network of economists, but the views that I'll express here today are my own, and they don't belong to the group, the policy research in macroeconomics. We have disagreements amongst ourselves. So what explains the gap between the rich and the poor in Ireland? Now, I'm not, a, um, I'm not an inequality person. I'm not a microeconomist. I look at the world from a macro point of view, and I know very little about inequality. I follow with uh, respect the work of colleagues that do. So I'm coming at this from a very macro perspective. And I want to ask if the difference, the reason for the rising inequality in Ireland is to do with, the, with credit, easy, liberalized, globalized credit is the cause of rising inequality, not just in Ireland, but around the world. Now, I wanted to start with this story, which I only discovered yesterday. There's a horse called Frankel, which apparently is the greatest racehorse ever. And it is reckoned that he is worth 100 million pounds. He's racing tomorrow. I think it's his last race. And he's worth 100 million pounds. Now, this horse is a great asset. And the reason that he's worth £100 million isn't just that he can win races and that he wins them relentlessly, almost without fail. It's that they can extract a sort of rent from, from, from his services. Uh, and I think it's called nomination, when he is offered to other studs, basically. And a shot of his semen, apparently, can cost the person buying it, £100,000. So if every time he is nominated, it's possible for this horse to earn rent of £100,000 for his owner, that is why he's worth £100 million. It's the capacity of the asset to generate rent, which is what makes the asset valuable. And a racehorse is an asset in that sense. When you live in council housing, when you're poor, and you have no access to assets, you also do not have access to credit. And you are therefore not able to leverage your wealth. In fact, you deleverage it on the whole because you borrow against the fact that you have few assets. Now, those with assets can borrow against the value of their assets. And assets, as you know, range in a variety. You can have stocks and shares are assets, property is assets, racehorses. Works of art, that's Damien Hirst's skull with diamonds, which is worth, I'm told, was sold for 18 million bucks. A brand is an asset which is rent-seeking because McDonald's uh, uh, puts out the franchise and earns rent each time a franchisee takes it on. And a yacht is an asset. And the key thing about owning those assets is that they enable you to borrow more. And by that means, you're able to inflate the value of your asset. Those without assets cannot borrow or can only borrow at highly extortionate rates of interest. The effortless, deregulated creation of credit inflates the value of assets. One of the things I hate most about the dishonesty of the global economic narrative is that we were taught from about the 1970s onwards, number one, that Keynes was responsible for inflation, whereas, in fact, the people who created easy credit were responsible for inflation. Remember, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods and services. The unions always get blamed. The people making too much money never get blamed. But when we had the period from 1980 to 2007, when we had a massive inflation in the value of assets, our central bank governors and policymakers never once complained about the inflation of assets. They complained about the inflation of prices and wages and imposed policies for repressing, depressing, and um, deflating prices and wages and salaries and allowed assets to inflate to an extent that was, is unheard of in history and never once never once objected to that rate of inflation. And of course, here in Ireland, it was most spectacular. The average price for a Dublin home had risen by more than 
by 1994. So liberalisation, reinforced by Ireland's EU membership, and I'll come to that, created asset bubbles in property, racehorses, brands, stocks and shares, works of art. We just watched these prices get inflated every year. We watched the huge um, art auctions taking place and were stunned at the prices that we were getting. And nobody ever complained from the policy community. The result, of course, of credit inflating the values of asset is that those who had assets then acquired more assets, and their assets became more valuable. And this is a, an example of it, Sean Quinn's house in Ballyconnell County, Cavan. Apparently, it may be a model of the house. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was ever built. But you can see how his money, his assets made it more money for him. And this is the notorious wedding cake, which I've only just heard about. The cake that he had baked for his daughter's wedding, which it is alleged... <coughs> And, you know, I don't want to go to court on this. It's alleged cost $100,000 and was baked in New York and flown over in a jet aeroplane. And the 20 boxes of cake were assembled in time for the wedding. So that's the kind of extravagance and excessive inflation of, 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 of wealth that happened under this regime, the so-called the great moderation that policymakers boast of. So simultaneously, policies were applied to deflate or moderate wages and salaries and prices as a share of GDP across the world. Subprimers, the people who were earning less and whose, whose wages and incomes were falling in real terms, supplemented their falling incomes by borrowing. So the typical uh, subprimer was a woman hairdresser in Michigan on $7 an hour who couldn't get a roof over her head and who borrowed $300,000 to buy a house so that she wouldn't be homeless, but with no intention or no capacity of repaying it, but paid probably something like 17% on that $300,000. And while the bankers could collect that money, they collected. And of course, it, the bubble had to burst. And the bubble did burst. So our policymakers, our so-called orthodox economists in charge of the global economy, sat and watched the massive inflation of a massive credit bubble, which inflated an asset bubble, and eventually it was burst. So the primary cause of the Irish financial crisis was unprecedented inflation and then deflation of a vast expanse of deregulated, liberalised private credit created by Eurozone banks and financial entities, created, in other words, by private wealth. So it was burst, it was burst by high real rates of interest. The, the mythology is that interest rates were very low. They were very low in 2000. Greenspan brought down interest rates in New York in response to the crisis of, that had been brought about by the dot-com bubble. That crash was a very devastating crash and could have had dire consequences if he hadn't drastically reduced interest rates as a reaction to the crash. That, of course, then reinvigorated the inflating bubble of credit. But what he then did was to move them up. So here, this is from Richard Koo. You can see what's happening to base rates. Now, base rates are not what the rates that you and I ever paid for our loans on any risky enterprise we may have had. We paid much, much higher rates. These are central bank rates. And if you see how the step, they stepped upwards before the crisis in 2007, they turn into daggers aimed at the bubble, the vast bubble of credit. Which, and they burst the vast bubble of credit, and then, of course, they're brought down. So the cause of the bursting of the, the bubble was that eventually the debt becomes unpayable because of high rates of interest. So then this led to the poor losing income, to being burdened by debt, and, of course, getting poorer. That's, for me, really a big part of the explanation of the rise in inequality. What happened to assets was that they, too, began to fall in value. And I was interested to read that the aggregate value of racehorses here in Ireland, which it was a big business, it sold at Irish sales, has dropped by almost 60% to 81 million euros from 191 million euros. So the fact is that the people who own racehorses have found their assets devaluing, but they still have 61 million euros against which 
to gamble every Saturday afternoon or whenever it is there's a race and against which it is uh, to extract rent. So it's greatly devalued their assets, but it hasn't completely destroyed the ability of them to raise uh, uh, rent from it. Having said that, I've heard these nightmare stories about horses running wild and uh, being uh, slaughtered all across, not just here in Ireland, but also in, in Spain. So the losses of national income, and here I'm quoting one Michael Taft, have largely fallen on the poor, and he shows the, uh, the, the increase in disposable income for the lowest decile as minus 18.6 in 2010, minus 10 uh, for the middle decile, and 4.1 plus. So those with money, those with assets, are still find their incomes rising here. And this, for me, is the, the inequality in this crisis. But this is the chart that I want to show you that terrified me when I, I found it. I've been, I read McKinsey quite closely because of, uh, because of all the, de the data on British debt, but I had ne not looked at Irish debt in any great detail. This is a terrifying, a really terrifying chart. Irish debt in total is 663% of Irish GDP. And of that debt, a mere 85% of that is public. A mere 85%, not even 100%. This is, the public debt in Ireland has not even reached the levels it reached, you know, in, during the war in, in Britain, uh, when it was at 200%. Uh, this, is not, this is not at the highest level of public indebtedness yet in the world. But look at the private debt. Household debts and non-financial corporations and financial institutions. Now, this is dated back. This is backdated, um, but I think it relates more or less to 2010. But this is terrifying. This debt, I can tell you, is not going to get repaid. Come rain or shine, it is not possible for Ireland to repay private debts on this scale. They will not be repaid. The creditors know that. And, and, and I, I believe the policymakers know that too. So um, what's really interesting is that at the start of 2003, central bank figures put Irish private sector credit around about 110% of G GDP. This had risen to 200% by 2007. By 2010, Ireland had the highest level of private sector debt in the European Union, according to Eurostat. And in that year, it amounted private sector, not public sector, private sector, to 341.3% of GDP. Compare that to Greece, where private sector debt at that point was 124% of GDP. And in Italy, private sector debt was 126% of GDP. Ireland's private debt is way in excess of Greece's. And look at the mess that Greece is in. So, the aggregate debt, as I've said, is 663% of GDP. And the bulk of this debt is owed not to the IMF, the World Bank, the EU, or the ECB, but it is, it's owned, owed to private bankers, to private wealth, to Eurozone bankers, not even just Irish bankers. So right now, this debt is in a state of suspense, zombie-like in the midst of denial by the people who've lent the money, who, who believe that one day they will get it back again, even though those loans are not performing loans. It's in a state of suspense because I believe of rigid bankruptcy laws here in Ireland, because of rising unemployment, people can't pay, and falling real disposable incomes, all of the, the common old reasons why people can't pay back debts. And it's remained static at this level of non, uh, and the non-financial corporations, uh, i.e. this is the, the companies at 800 billion pounds since 2010. So companies are not paying a penny back. They're sitting with these debts on their books. And the really, the big lie is that the banks have these debts on their books and are pretending that these are performing loans, that these are performing debts at a time when unemployment in Ireland is rising systematically every quarter. So 
The uh, household leverage ratio measured as household liabilities as a percentage of their annual disposable income fell from a peak in 2010 quarter one, which was 221%. It fell in quarter three of 2010 to 217. In other words, the Irish started to pay down some of their debts, their household and their private debts. They started to pay them down, pay them off, or pay them down, or, or whatever. But by quarter three, 2011, the ratio stood at 219%. The ratio of debt had risen again, and this, according to the central bank, reflects the continued decline in households' disposable income. I have falling income and rising debt, and I'm not, I'm not able to repay. It's just not possible. It's physically not possible. Because this is what's happening to unemployment. And this is a, a, a chart that Krugman had in the New York Times the other day. The top, the blue unemployment uh, number there is Estonia. And you know, it's a bit of a poster child for the IMF, Estonia. So it's, it's, it's unemployment peaked a lot higher than Ireland's did, but has come down. The green one is Iceland. Iceland's unemployment did not rise to the same level as, as Ireland, and it's coming down. Look at Ireland's debt, uh, unemployment, which is the red line, which is steadily going up and is, shows no sign of coming down. So while banks' balance sheets have been given incredible support by sovereigns, by governments, and by other agencies, tough bankruptcy laws have left households, Irish households with mounting debts and high levels of leverage which stand to undermine an economic recovery. So they're, they're largely owed to European commercial banks. And this is something that I think we really ought to talk about a great deal more. The banks that are exposed to Ireland's private debt are not Irish banks. The biggest one is a German bank. These were banks that piled into the party when people like Sean Quinn were being lent crazy money and fraudulently lent crazy money. They were in there trying to get a bit of the pie. So all this stuff about the German banks being prudent and careful is really not the case. Of course, the Royal Bank of Scotland is in there because the Royal Bank of Scotland was reckless beyond belief. It's now no longer a private bank. It's owned by us taxpayers. Right, but the fact of the matter is that this were private banks making these reckless loans, which have now been transferred to the a taxpayer. And then you can see that the Allied Irish Bank and the Bank of Ireland's uh, exposure is less than those. But then there's Credit Ar Agricole, there's Danske Bank, there's HSBC, there's BNP Paribas, there's Group Societe Generale. They were all here enjoying the party. And they uh, are extraordinarily exposed to the static massive debt that is not being paid down and not being written off. Now, I want to whip you through a quick talk on money, which is very ambitious of me, but I really feel I need to do this so that we can understand why we're in this mess, because I don't believe it's, it's really understood properly. The narrative, as Sean says, has distorted the debate horribly. Can I say that this, this picture of, of, of Ireland's private debt and of the bank's exposure to it justifies what Paul Tucker said yesterday in his evidence to the Parliamentary Select Committee. Paul Tucker is standing to be the governor of the Bank of England. And he said he, uh, he feared that he and his financial policy committee fear a tidal wave of bank failures and defaults. And so do I. And I think he had Irish debtors in mind when he thought of a tidal wave of the bank failures. So what is money? There is a huge divide in economics about what is the nature of money and credit, and it is the reason we're in this mess. So Adam Smith said that money was a neutral medium that facilitated exchange on the great wheel of circulation, he called it. A neutral medium. That Paul Samuelson, who's, I think this is the ninth edition of his book on economics. When I last looked, there were 17 editions. There's not a, a student that has done Economics 101 who hasn't read Paul Samuelson. He said, even in the most advanced industrial economies, if we strip exchange down to its barest essentials and peel off the obscuring layer of money, 
we find that trade between individuals or nations largely boils down to barter. So what orthodox economists from Adam Smith through to Samuelson believe is that money is neutral, that it's a veil, that it's an obscuring layer, that actually it has nothing to do with the real economy. Now imagine if you're a banker that creates credit. How convenient to have the world's economists arguing that money is just a veil, irrelevant, and obscuring the real things going on in the economy. In the meantime, you can be creating credit here and having a party, and the economists don't even know what you're doing. So they obscured or ignored the role of credit in the economy, which is why they couldn't answer the Queen's question. Why did no one predict the credit crunch? Because no one was looking at credit and credit creation. Keynes understood money, and so did, for God's sake, the founders of the Bank of England in 1694, um, when they invented something called fountain pen money, when you entered a number into a ledger and charged it to somebody's account, and it became a deposit. So we have known and understood money and credit for a very long time, but the orthodox monetarist economists have dis did diverted and, uh, and, dis and, and confused us in ways that have been massively destructive. So capitalism has the capacity for what is known as the elastic production of money. And the way that money is produced under capitalism arises out of nothing more than the promise of repayment. Nothing more. OK? Keynes understood this, and Keynes taught this. And he, Keynes struggled to persuade other economists of this fact that lending alone by central banks and also by private commercial banks, creates deposits and savings. Monetarists and orthodox economists believe that deposits create loans, that you can't make a loan to Mrs. Jones until Mrs. Smith has put her savings into the bank. And I have to tell you that Tim Geithner takes that view as well, but I'm not going to give you a Tim Geithner quote here. Bernanke explained very clearly he gave the first ever television interview ever given by the Federal Re Governor Reserve in uh, 2009. And he gave it one day when the night before he'd given to AIG, which was an insurance company and should not have had an account with the Federal Reserve. He gave them, he first of all arranged for them to have an account with the Federal Reserve overnight because they were about to go bust and bring down the whole system. And then he gave them $160 billion. So the journalist interviewing him says, now, Mr. Bernanke, where did you get that $160 billion? Did you get it from taxation? And he says, no, it's not tax money. The banks have got accounts with the Fed. Now, this is not a bank, by the way. Much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account that they have with the Fed. And that is what banks have been doing since 1694. They haven't been waiting for Mrs. Jones to dump her savings in their vaults. They've entered numbers into a ledger with a fountain pen, and now they do it with a computer. And thank God they do. Thank God they do. Credit is one of the greatest civilizational advances that mankind, womankind, has made. If without it, we would not have found $16 trillion to bail out the financial system between 2007 and 9 across all the OECD countries. But it has to be managed and it has to be regulated. So all that central banks and commercial banks require is collateral. You, Mr. Sean Quinn, can have as much as you like. Go, please, for God's sake, Mr. Quinn, come and borrow 400 million euros because you've got these assets, and we need to guarantee your assets. Please, can we have your property if you default, or your racehorse, or your stocks and shares, or your Damien Hirst painting? And please, will you sign here to promise to repay at a certain rate of interest? That is all. And you may have 400 million euros. So Keynes understood that lending creates deposits. Monetarists argue the deposits create loans. And this is a very, f I want you to remember this chart. The two charts you have to remember is the one about Ireland's debt, which is terrifying. And the second one is this. 
um, that money is understood by the orthodox economists as a commodity effectively, and they, they, they use language like it's subject to supply and demand. You know, Mr. Osborne tells me there is no money in the bank, he says. Mr. Ed Miliband says, well, you know, because there's no money, we can't, we're going to have to do zero budgeting, right? Wherever we go, politicians are telling, there is no money. They lie through their teeth. There is loads of money. It is not a commodity. It is not subject to supply and demand, to marginal utility, to stocks and, you know, it's not a velocity thing. It's not a circulatory thing. The really critical error is that, it, that Orthodox argue that you need savings in the bank to finance borrowing, speculation, investment, and economic recovery. You have to have austerity to generate, to shore up the savings in the bank in order for us to invest in the future some 20 years hence. That is not true. We do not have to have austerity. We could have $3 trillion tomorrow to revive Ireland's economy. The critical thing would be how we would regulate and manage that credit, not the, the availability. Because under a modern 1694, post-1694 banking system, there is no limit to the creation of credit by either central or co commercial banks. There need be no limit whatsoever. Of course, there are constraints. You have the constraint, and I can hear already the questions coming. If you create too much credit, you get inflation, which is what we've had since 1980 to 27. Inflation of assets. If you create too little credit for the economy, you get deflation, which is what we're threatened with right now. So you have to manage that. You can't leave it to crazy guys running banks with no experience whatsoever of the economy and no understanding of economics. So in the monetary economies, and I work in Africa, right? I work in countries which don't have banking and monetary systems. They can't do what we can do in our systems. The relevant consideration is the availability of finance, not savings to fund, for example, economic recovery. And here I'm coming to a deeply controversial bit of my presentation. I know it will be controversial here, which is that the deeply flawed economic orthodoxy, which says you need to make savings first, you need austerity in order to grow, informs the liberalization of finance and austerity that underpins the Maastricht and Lisbon treaties and the mandate of the European Central Bank. The Eurozone Euro monetary framework obliges sovereigns to borrow from private banks. It blocks the ECB from creating credit to lend to sovereigns. It facilitates capital mobility. It says, let money flow across. If Mr. Sean Quinn wants to get his money across to uh, Estonia, you know, fraudulently, let him do it. And borrowing across borders. I was in Hungary at the height of the boom when there were Irish people in Hungary buying Hungarian flats because they could no longer afford to buy flats in, Dumbl in Dublin, so they'd moved to Budapest. And they were borrowing money from the Swiss banks at Swiss bank interest rates and without any regard for the exchange rate between the euro and, and, and Swiss, uh, Swiss, what is, for God's sake, I've forgotten, yes. So when the crunch came, what happened to those Irish people in Budapest who had borrowed money from Swiss banks to buy a flat in Budapest because they couldn't afford to live here? But that is what the Eurozone, the Eurozone framework enables them to do. It keeps unregulated uh, commercial interest rates high, and it makes it difficult, the Eurozone framework, for sovereign governments, democratic governments, to manage and pay down their debt by using monetary policy to finance economic recovery and thereby to generate the income, wages, profits, tax revenues needed to pay down both private and public debts. You can only do two things with, with debt. You can either earn the income to pay it down, and there's only one way to get the income to pay it down, and that's through employment. Even if you're a small business, You've got to have your customers have got to be employed in order to, for you to make the profit you need to pay down your debt. Okay? If your customers are all unemployed, your business ain't going to function. Right? If you're a small person and you've borrowed crazy money to get a roof over your head, you need a job to pay back your mortgage. Right? But our policymakers seem to think that we can cope with our debts by becoming unemployed. Um, 
if you're a government and you've got a deficit and you have debt, well, you've got to generate the income to pay it down. Now, what you can do is you can cut the knees off your economy and make more people unemployed. They'll pay fewer taxes and you'll pay more benefits. Um, but that ain't going to bring down your debt. It's going to make your debt worse. We wrote a paper back in 2008 saying that austerity was going to increase the British government's borrowing. And that is exactly what it's doing. And we are saying we told you so. And they're saying you're just too clever by half. <laughs> right, so... And then the Eurozone uses outstanding public debt as an opportunity to intervene in sovereign, intervene in sovereign policy making to restructure economies in favour of the private sector and haute finance. I'm afraid that I don't believe for a moment that Greece is going to be allowed to default. I don't believe for a moment that Greece will be allowed to leave the Eurozone. She will not be allowed to leave the Eurozone until the Eurozone has restructured her economy and made it something that the banks consider favourable to their interest. And the same will apply to Ireland. If Ireland stays inside the Eurozone, her economy is going to be restructured by those at the centre of the Eurozone. So the, Euros the Euro and the Maastricht Treaty, the monetary, mon not the Euro, not the European ideal. We're not talking about the European ideal, which I love and I'm committed to. I'm a Europhile. I'm a, I love the European culture and I want Europe to be bigger and better than the United States. I want us to compete with China. So we need to be big. But the monetary framework locks Eurozone countries in exactly the same way as the gold standard did in the 1920s and 30s into easy, liberalized borrowing across borders and then into a debt deflationary spiral, exactly as what happened under the gold standard, which simultaneously causes structural divergence across the Eurozone and social and political upheaval, which is why the, you know, the award of the Nobel Prize last week was so ludicrous in the midst of the divergence and the division of Europe at the very moment when d Europe is being torn apart by its monetary policies, it gets the Nobel Prize for peace. And that will discredit the Nobel Prize for some time, I reckon. The euro must be understood, not as a currency of the peoples, and all of our currencies have been, currency, have been public goods, currencies of the people. But the, the euro must be understood as an ideal of creditors and bankers of private wealth. That's what it's there for. It's a perversion of the greatest monies in history. It's the perversion of what a currency should be. Ireland does not need to live and work within a monetary framework designed to suit the interests of private wealth. Today it is private wealth, bankers and money lenders that need Ireland. Ireland does not need private wealth. On 20th of June, the acting head of the IMF called for the immediate and far-reaching structural reforms, privatisation and the opening of markets to foreign ownership and competition, which proves our point. Private wealth needs Ireland. Ireland does not need private wealth. Without your taxes, your sacrifices, these bankers once again face Armageddon, as they did in the autumn of 2008, and they know it. Paul Tucker of the Bank of England knows it. Mervyn King has said we've got to shore up the public finances because another crisis is coming. Everybody at the highest level knows it. The Irish people don't know it. They're simply handing over their spare cash and their tiny incomes to banks, and they're not even Irish banks, that lent recklessly and expect to be bailed out to defy market forces and not be disciplined for the wrong market decisions they made. So he warned yesterday of a tidal wave of bank failures and defaults. That's what we have coming. And I think when he did so, he was thinking of Irish debtors. He was thinking of that 600% of GDP of debt, about 500% of which is private debt, which is never going to be repaid. That is exposure to those banks, and that's why they're worried. So financial liberalization has failed. The only way forward is a new arrangement based on ones that have better served society since the dawn of civilization, since Aristotle defined the evils of usury and the barrenness of prosperity based simply on speculation.
And the first step, I must say, must be the abandoning of the monetary framework of the euro. Only then can the people of Ireland, and indeed of Europe, begin the long process of regaining policy autonomy and democratically deploying policy to end the gross inequality brought about by financial liberalisation. Thank you. Great to see uh, things being said straight, and Sean the same. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I remain to be convinced on abandoning the euro, and specifically the last time that the world has burnt the bankers in the ex to the extent that you're suggesting they should be burnt was in the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So I would like to understand how you would see that play out because the Great Depression did uh, cause a lot of distress for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I do believe that what we're going through is, is far bigger in scale than the Great Depression. Um, but I do believe also that the, the kicking the can down the street uh, to, to buy time has been an effective policy to avoid the consequences that came immediately with the Great Depression. Thank you. Previous question would take you at least a <laughs> quarter of an hour to answer that. <laughs> but congratulations to both speakers on excellent, uh, on excellent exposition. And can I ask you very briefly, I'll give you an example of my problem with this. I happen to be speaking to a group in London last night, which is quite a left-wing group, and you were talking about economic literacy. And one of the people who my discussant, mm -hmm. you probably know, is John Palmer. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I was talking about there's no real debt overhang problem. There's a problem, I mean, essentially, QE could be used to monetize the debt, to monetize the budget deficit, and to invest in real resources to get expansion going again. Mm -hmm. John said, oh, no, 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 no. Inflation, inflation, you'd have hyperinflation overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I said to John, do you believe in the quantity theory of money? He didn't have a clue what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on that? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I found the presentation a little bit confusing. Uh, I had the impression that at the beginning you had a different message than at the end. At the beginning you were highly skeptical of debt. Uh, you were thinking it's too much debt. And at the end you were, from my point of view, rightly pointing out that uh, creation of credit, there is enough money we can create um, in order to avoid any crisis. Um, just perhaps to go through some points. Uh, you said European monetary policy has been too liberal. Uh, I, I don't think uh, that is true. For instance, for Germany, European monetary policy was much too strict for many, many years between 98 and 2006. Uh, real interest rates in Germany were too high. We had a period of stagnation. They were too low for periphery countries, but not for Germany. And of course, the ECB had to choose some interest rate which is uh, fitting everybody, but of course, not one size does not fit all. Then you said Greece would never be allowed to default. It has been allowed to default. Actually, Greece defaulted on private debt. I personally lost half of my Greek bond values uh, where I had put some of my savings in. That, and that is my private wealth, which is sacrificed to save uh, Greece and Greece public budget. Um, then your McKinsey data. I think uh, that is basically cross debt and not net debt. The net financial wealth of the earth is zero. Every debt is mirrored in a wealth of somebody else, assets of somebody else. So. Uh, Probably most of what you say are debts, and these are debts, and that are debts. Let's say the assets of the private sector, the, let's say the, the, the debt of the government is in wealth of the private sector. And you have to discount this from the cross debt of the private sector. Uh, if we borrow from each other, each one a billion US dollars or euros, we will increase cross debt dramatically in the world. Or 
let's say we borrow one trillion each other. Huh? Each of one has a balance sheet which is extended by assets of one trillion, which is our uh, what claim to the other one, and the liability. Huh? Mm -hmm. So um, that is not really a problem. Nobody does expect that all that are going to repay it. Public <laughs> debts are seldom repaid. It's a good way to, let's say, save money to, to store wealth. People, because of democracy and everything else, want to have these big stocks of debt. And, well, I <laughs> go on here. Uh, what is the appropriate amount of credit which should be created in an economy? That's you, for central bankers to judge. It's well, a yeah, yeah, it's, it, can we leave it to the bankers? And, and why did credit yeah, expand so rapidly and dramatically during the period of the Great Moderation? Because a lot of new jobs were created, productivity increased in the world economy dramatically, in China, for instance, because distribution worst, because wages went down and profits went up, so assets became more valuable. That is, I think, uh, um, Michael, behind I, it. I'm going to... Uh, uh, On the Great Depression, um, what happened was we were told that if we left, Britain was told, and the Americans were told, Roosevelt, uh, that the end of the world as we know it. Okay? And Keynes said no. He called the gold standard a barbarous relic. And in 1933, Keynes persuaded the Treasury and the Bank of England Montague Norman was sent off to a sanatorium in Switzerland to, to bail out of the uh, gold standard. And from there on, Britain began to recover. In the United States, it was far more dramatic. Uh, Roosevelt told the bankers to go to hell. He said, I invite your enmity. I want you to hate me. It's a good thing. And he began to pump, basically, QE into the economy. We got Roosevelt and recovery um, in the United States and here. In Europe, they took a different path, okay? The Germans, Hitler, the Germans decided to stick with austerity on the one hand, post Weimar, and secondly, to stick with liberalization of finance. The bankers still, could still get their money in and out of Germany regardless. So the com combination of finance, financial liberalization and austerity gave us fascism on the one hand in Europe, and in the United States, it gave us something quite different, and Britain was fortunate enough to be closer to the Americans than they were to the German uh, way of dealing. But we got out of the gold standard and we recovered, despite all the threats. And we're getting the same threats now about the euro. George, on hyperinflation, this is the, the usual thing. Um, the, the point about, you know, and I understand my friend's confusion here, because I am saying... Private debt is a really big problem if the capacity of the private debtor to repay is li limited. But the private debt is very different from the public debt. What the monetarists and the orthodox will not do is make the distinction between private and public debt. There's huge differences. Governments, for example, um, can't go bankrupt. Not even Zimbabwe. Okay? They cannot be bankrupted. They, the taxpayers stay in the country, they are there. They can be broken, they can be impoverished, and their incomes can be cut, but actually they can't, but private businesses can. There's lots of, private businesses cannot ask the Bank of England to effectively print money, they can't effectively ask the Bank of England to print money for you. I can't get Mr. Mervyn King to create QE for me to get me out of my difficulties. The government can. There are big differences between private and public uh, abilities to deal with debt, which is why I make a big distinction between the two. But on hyperinflation, uh, on hyperinflation, the credit, the creation of credit, the, the thing about a banking system is that it works well when it works as a virtuous circle, where you create sufficient credit for the capacity of the economy to absorb that credit and to be purring along on the basis of that credit, creating jobs and income and, and profits. As I said before, if you create too much, you get inflation. If you create too little, you get deflation. Now, how you manage and how you measure the capacity of the economy to absorb credit 
is a, a, a skill for the, for the statisticians and for the central bankers. That is what what's managing the economy is called and what it's about. That's the responsibility they have. Um, so there is no risk of hyperinflation and there is particularly not a, ris a risk of hyperinflation when you have dug a crater of economic ac inactivity out of the economy. You've blown a hole in the economy and there's a big hole and you're pumping money into it and until you reach the full capacity of the hole, you're not going to have inflation, okay? But you will get inflation if that money goes into speculation and into wasted projects. It has to go into the kind of productive activity which generates income, which generates profits, which generates taxation and revenues, and comes back to the government and to the central bank to pay for the credit. That's the virtuous circle. What happens is, under liberalization, the money is spurted out and it goes into speculation out there, God knows where, probably investment in the Brazilian real or whatever, uh, commodities, you name it, or horse racing. But if it were to be directed, as Keynes insisted it should be directed in the 30s, into productive activity, the banks were told they had to lend to the government at 1% and that if they did not, the guarantees and the, and the subsidies would be taken away. Okay, And they did. They lend. They were told you can't lend for speculative purposes. If you do, again, we'll punish you. We'll discipline you. You can only uh, lend for pro projects that are going to be profitable and generate incomes and revenue. So it's this circle which has to be ma maintained, and which is hard to maintain and to manage. That's what we have central banks and treasuries for. Um, uh, monetary, monetary policy is just not about interest rates. It's also about capital mobility. So I agree with you that interest rates between 2000 interest rates were never intended to be there for the German economy or for the interests of the German economy. They were intended to be there for the purposes of capital finance moving across borders and for whatever purposes they needed it to be for. So, and you were right that Greece has defaulted on a tiny proportion of her private debt. But by when I said I would, don't believe Greece would be allowed to default, I meant she wouldn't be allowed to default on all of her debt and just refuse to pay her debt. That is all public debt now. Yes, but she's not going to be allowed to default on it. Because if she did, if she did default, if she did what Peru did, for example, back in the 1980s, then she would get out from underneath the creditors and they would not be able to restructure her economy. So they're going to do what the IMF and the World Bank has done to all the poor countries, and I know that's where I come from. That's where all my work was, with the sovereign debt of the poor countries. They were not allowed to get out of debt. They were not allowed to... So, for example, post-Second World War, Americans gave us the Marshall Plan. They did not want to give us a loan, because we may have repaid it. Okay, and if we'd repaid it, that would have meant competition with American exports. So we got the Marshall Plan instead. So, you know, the debt is a, a major geopolitical instrument and it's being used in Europe to restructure economies. And I tell you, that's what's going to happen here. Uh, and and I, I mean, sometimes economies need restructuring. I think my economy needs restructuring. It's far too imbalanced towards the finance sector. I'm in favour of restructuring. But who decides? And whose interests, on, in whose interests should they should it be done. So I, I don't think you and I are going to agree. I think we're fundamentally and diametrically opposed. And, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time trying to persuade to monetarists how wrong they are. Uh, but I don't succeed. And I, so I'm going to give up trying, really. But the fact of the matter is I want to say to the Irish people, you don't need to do this for the bankers. They need you more than you need them. Because if you don't pay your debts, they are going bust. And they know it. And so they're bringing the forces of the IMF, the EU, everything to bear to milk you of the rent that they are demanding of you for loans that they should never have made to you in the first place. Thank you. I admire your dynamics, uh, but we have the wisdom as well. You have two economists and four opinions. And I must really say that with most of your things, I disagree profoundly. Mm -hmm. If you put trillions into the Irish economy, you will have exactly the same problem what you have accused rightly before when you said the German banks, it's one bank, the other 500 German banks didn't go that way. The other point which you said about Hungary, 
Yes, Irish people bought apartments in Hungary, but not because the, uh, the flats were too dear here. They wanted to invest in something else because they were thinking in a type of pension and not in a type of speculation. So I think many of your things which you mentioned here are not real. And let me just say one. I'm a convinced European. I admire the uh, splendid isolation of your uh, analysis as a Brit. But uh, you should consider, please, please you should consider, <laughs> you should consider that the European <laughs> Union is a political issue. If you only consider that as economists, for example, the euro as well, the, the euro is a political decision. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we economists are limited. And we have to minimize the damage which might come out of that. But as a convinced European, I only can say, hopefully, Ireland will stay in the European uh, Union and in the Eurozone. And uh, I wouldn't mind if the Brits don't get in. Huh. This may be a very stupid question, as I'm not an economist, but I keep wondering, where is this money that was all loaned out? Because for every inflated asset that was bought, somebody was paid a lot of money for it. So where does it go? Is it just disappear? Is it imaginary? Does it not exist? But it must be somewhere, or where is it? <laughs> Thank you. William Scully is my name. <clears throat> I would tend to agree with the second now speaker, but... I, I don't want to be hard on the British or the British mind, but people tell me that if I read the Financial Times about Europe, that I'm automatically sort of biased, and even the people who try to be objective in British newspapers about the Eurozone can't be. But may I take issue with you on, on, on Frankel? You know, you're talking about rents. I mean, there's <laughs> all businessmen seek rents, but for if if, if in the way you're defining it, if Frankel gets a rent, there are literally thousands of other racehorses who've got negative rents. I mean, racing is a subsidised business, admittedly, but it's a business in Ireland that employs 25 or 30,000 people. Uh, but I, I would take issue, issue very strongly with you. Of course, there's an awful lot of things done wrong in the management of the European crisis. I mean, I, I totally accept that, and, and we, 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 might, we might agree on some things, but, uh, you know... Uh, so far in Ireland, uh, in difficulty, uh, <clears throat> social welfare rates have been paid, public servants have been paid, the country has functioned, the banks have functioned, the ATM machines haven't stopped, and uh, they, they, they've, they've given out money. There's a cost on that, there's a price on it, but I think you have to balance that type of uh, a sort of negative stability, if you like, that we have to get out of with your a sort of vision of some sort of transformative vision, uh, out of which it might well be that the poor would suffer the most. That's what they said in 1933, you know. That's exactly the kind of uh, blackmail that was applied in 1933 to the gold standard. And I, um, you know, I want to say this, and I, I didn't have time to make it clear, and, and I see I'm being labelled as a common old garden British Eurosceptic. I'm not, actually. I don't, I don't like the Eurosceptics. They're nationalists. They are little Englanders. I'm not that. Actually, I'm a South African. I'm, I'm cosmopolitan. I spend my time internationally. I'm not even a Brit in the real sense. I'm a British citizen, but, you know, you can't, can, you can't define me as a little Englander. I am someone who's worked on sovereign debt in the poorest countries, and um, came to understand how they'd got into the terrible mess they'd got in. And when I looked up, I saw that their debts were tiny compared to the Anglo-American debts that were looming. So in 2003, I wrote a book saying, this is all going to fall down. There's this huge credit bubble that's going to burst. And then in 2006, I began to panic. And I wrote another book, and it was called by the awful title of, uh, or the cheerful title of the coming first world debt crisis. So I come at this from that perspective, and I'm looking at Europe and at Greece and at Ireland in the same way as I looked at Rwanda and Uganda and Guatemala and all of those sovereign debtor countries and what was happening to them under their IMF adjustment programs. 
and I'm looking at and I'm seeing something um, f from that economic perspective. And I'm seeing what the economists are doing to the political project. I'm seeing how they are destroying the political project. And it's breaking my heart. And it's breaking everybody's heart. I do not want to see the rise of fascism in Greece or Europe again. I have grandchildren. I do not want to bestow that future on them. I can see policy making, makers making the same mistakes they made in the 1920s and 30s. And then when the rise of Hitler came, they all said, oh, nothing to do with me, governor, right? So I'm not coming at this as a common old garden, you know, British Eurosceptic conservative. I'm not that person at all. I'm coming at it as an economist who saw what the IMF and the structural adjustment programs and liberalization did to poor countries and now what it's doing to countries at the core. And I'm saying that uh, we can't go on serving the bankers because the bankers have no sense of what's good for them, never mind for us. If the Irish are not paying, the thing about the Irish situation is that it's static. Everyone thinks the, sta the stability that you're speaking of is like a zombie stability, really, because the debts are not going away. They're not being pe written off. There's no bankruptcy process to say, well, look, how do we manage all these Irish people that took out crazy loans and built property? How do we manage their relationship with that German bank and with the Royal Bank of Scotland? The Royal Bank of Scotland is pretending that the Irish are going to pay. And the Irish are pretending that they're going to pay, but we know that they're not paying. Now, we can keep that little sort of dream going for a while, but it's not real. You know, it's not real. And when it bursts, you know, when, when the unemployment, which is ratcheting up here in Ireland quarter by quarter, unfailingly, means that people don't pay their mortgages, the RBS is down the pan. And so are all those other European banks, never mind the Irish banks. So, you know, if I were a banker, and I, the bankers are worried. So if we're worried about bankers, let's worry about them. Let's worry about what's going to happen to them. They need their debts either renegotiated, restructured, written off, or repaid. You know, now, to, to make people make the debtor unemployed means they're not going to get repaid, and they're going to go bust again. And then they're all going to be nationalized, and that's going to be the end of it. So it's not good for bankers. So this is all I'm trying to say. So I really don't think, I think it's wrong. And I knew when I came here, because I know how pro-Europe Europe, uh, is this constituency. I know how, what a yearning there is across Europe for unity and for peace. And I know that my voice and what I'm saying sounds disruptive and sounds dissident. Um, so I do think I was quite brave saying all this stuff, really, <laughs> knowing what I know, how I know you think. But I think we have to say these things because we have to say them for the sake of our, for our institutions as well as for, for our people, as well as for future generations. So I think I've rambled on enough. That's what they said in 1933, you know. That's exactly the kind of uh, blackmail that was applied in 1933 to the gold standard. And I, um, you know, I want to say this, and I, I didn't have time to make it clear, and, and I see I'm being labelled as a common old garden British Eurosceptic. I'm not, actually. I don't, I don't like the Eurosceptics. They're nationalists. They are little Englanders. I'm not that. Actually, I'm a South African. I'm, I'm cosmopolitan. I spend my time internationally. I'm not even a Brit in the real sense. I'm a British citizen, but you know, you can't, you can't define me as a little Englander. I am someone who's worked on sovereign debt in the poorest countries and um, came to understand how they'd got into the terrible mess they'd got in. And when I looked up, I saw that their debts were tiny compared to the Anglo-American debts that were looming. So in 2003, I wrote a book saying, this is all going to fall down. There's this huge credit bubble that's going to burst. And then in 2006, I began to panic. And I wrote another book. And it was called by the awful title of, uh, or the cheerful title of the coming first world debt crisis. And it's stone. So I come at this from that perspective. And I'm looking at Europe and at Greece and at Ireland in the same way as I looked at Rwanda and Uganda and Guatemala and all of those sovereign debtor countries and what was happening to them under their IMF adjustment programs. And I'm looking at and I'm seeing something um, from that economic perspective. 
And I'm seeing what the economists are doing to the political project. I'm seeing how they are destroying the political project. And it's breaking my heart. And it's breaking everybody's heart. I do not want to see the rise of fascism in Greece or Europe again. I have grandchildren. I do not want to bestow that future on them. I can see policy making, makers making the same mistakes they made in the 1920s and 30s. And then when the rise of Hitler came, they all said, oh, nothing to do with me, governor, right? So I'm not coming at this as a common old garden, you know, British Eurosceptic conservative. I'm not that person at all. I'm coming at it as an economist who saw what the IMF and the structural adjustment programs and liberalization did to poor countries and now what it's doing to countries at the core. And I'm saying that uh, we can't go on serving the bankers because the bankers have no sense of what's good for them, never mind for us. If the Irish are not paying, the thing about the Irish situation is that it's static. Everyone thinks the, sta the stability that you're speaking of is like a zombie stability, really, because the debts are not going away. They're not being pet written off. There's no bankruptcy process to say, well, look, how do we manage all these Irish people that took out crazy loans and built property? How do we manage their relationship with that German bank and with the Royal Bank of Scotland? The Royal Bank of Scotland is pretending that the Irish are going to pay. And the Irish are pretending that they're going to pay, but we know that they're not paying. Now, we can keep that little sort of dream going for a while, but it's not real. You know, it's not real. And when it bursts, you know, when, when the unemployment, which is ratcheting up here in Ireland quarter by quarter, unfailingly, means that people don't pay their mortgages, the RBS is down the pan. And so are all those other European oh. banks, never mind the Irish banks. So, you know, if I were a banker, and I, the bankers are worried. So if we're worried about bankers, let's worry about them. Let's worry about what's going to happen to them. They need their debts either renegotiated, restructured, written off, or repaid. You know, now, to, to make people make the debtor unemployed means they're not going to get repaid, and they're going to go bust again. And then they're all going to be nationalized, and that's going to be the end of it. So it's not good for bankers. So this is all I'm trying to say. So I really don't think, I think it's wrong. And I knew when I came here, because I know how pro-Europe Europe uh, is this constituency. I know how, what a yearning there is across Europe for unity and for peace. And I know that my voice and what I'm saying sounds disruptive and sounds dissident. Um, so I do think I was quite brave saying all this stuff, really, <laughs> knowing what I know, how I know you think. But I think we have to say these things because we have to say them for the sake of our for our institutions as well as for, for our people, as well as for future generations. So I think I've rambled on enough. I will, I will make three uh, simple comments. Um, they're not necessary. I have a doubt in the world that the IMF and the World Bank operated in Africa on the basis of the interests of international bankers and international finance and not on the basis of what was good for the global south. And I would be quite happy to document that. I worked very closely with World Bank projects and during the Sahel drought, which was the first main drought, that was, major drought that was reported even slightly in the north of the world in the 70s uh, in the north of Nigeria. Uh, the Sahel drought was across the countries at the top and uh, above, above Nigeria, the north of Nigeria, uh, north, north of it. And I worked in Nigeria uh, generating quite closely with World Bank projects and stuff and discovered uh, quite an amount of what I came to know was normal practice subsequently in the, of the World Bank and subsequently the IMF and so on. Uh, it is not a, pr a pretty sight. Africa today would hardly be held up as a model of why you should restructure on the basis of what the IMF or the World Bank told you. That's just one fact, my view of it, whatever. Second thing is about Frankel. And the, with these comments and the thing, I take the point, but I really do have a problem with the fact that Ireland's poor people are subsidising every single person who goes into a racetrack or into a dog track, 
uh, paying quite substantial money. It's reduced a bit since from what it was, but the ESRI study that was done by, by Tony Fahey, I think, uh, showed that for every single person who went to a race meeting, 40 euro of taxpayers' money was supplementing that person or subsidizing that person. And I certainly take, um, except we should learn, you know, and I, I take serious exception, for example, to the massive uh, publicity and support and a whole lot of other stuff given to uh, 600 <coughs> jobs created by paddypower.com last week. Gambling is what got us into this mess. Reckless gambling by German banks and others who gave us, who gambled their money in places like here, and we wind up paying it back. We, the taxpayer, Ireland's poor, who lose their services and have charges appoint, uh, lose and lose their money, uh, have their money reduced, their welfare reduced, and have charges put uh, on services and so on, or if there was charges there already, they're increased. A whole lot of stuff. And we are paying back the gambling debts of those banks, etc. And we then think, we then put up on a pedestal a company that's basic work is gambling for the, for, for the, the mess of pottage is like 600 euro or 600 jobs. Come on, guys. Let them do the 600 jobs. It's good for them. But don't let's pretend that in some way or other this is the rescue of the Irish economy, which is the kind of way it was presented, right up to the top politicians out launching it and so on. Uh, that's the second point. The final point I want to make is the most important point I want to make by far. I'm no expert on money or on banks or banking. Uh, my expertise in other areas. But I, it is quite clear to me that the debt issue is a political issue and not an economic issue. It is quite clear that historically decisions were made, political decisions, to deal with debt in different ways. Britain dealt with its debt after the Second World War in one way, by paying it all back over quite a number of years. The French dealt with it in a different way by allowing dramatic inflation. And the Germans dealt with it in a different way again because the, because the Americans insisted that the debt had to be written off. Now, the Marshall Plan went in as well, but the write-off of the debt was a political decision forced by the Americans because they did not want, well, for their own interest at one level, but they also didn't want a, a repetition of what had happened uh, in, at the end of the First World War which had given rise to the far right and the Weimar Republic and all the rest of it, and fascism. So I think there is an issue, it goes back to the point I'm making about narrative. It, 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 like it is untrue in the narrative that the debt is an economic issue only and that we have no choice or we had no choice. It is a political issue and at the end of the day, the decisions are made in the political arena and if we wind up, as I suspect we are going to wind up, unable to meet the Troika's uh, targets a few years down the line uh, and have ourselves in even, deep, even deeper trouble, they are the results of political decisions. And I think those decisions are still not over. Those decisions are being made year in, year out. They're being made now by the present government. I think if we thought about it in those political terms uh, and developed a narrative that told the truth. And I know there's all sorts of stuff around truth, but let's not give away to Pilate's question, you know, what is truth? Let's tell the, put all the facts that are on the table and put as much of the, like put any facts on the table, as long as they're facts and can be shown to be true, put them on the table and let's see if we can get decisions that in some way or other get us out of the incredible mess that we're in. I don't think it's possible to overstate the mess we're actually in. Thank you, Sean.